Hi, uh, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of the Spectral Geometry in the Clouds uh, seminar. Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Michaela Gidi from uh, the University of Rostock, who will talk to us today about complex analysis, thick sets, and spectral inequalities. As usual, if you have questions during the talk, either just unmute yourself and ask it directly, or write it in the chat, and we will relay it uh, to Michaela. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for uh, for having me here. And most of all, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly, because not many people <laughs> get that right. And uh, so the topic of today is going to be uh, thick sets and spectral inequalities. The complex analysis will be for us just uh, just a tool. So um, the focus is on on the two um, on on uh, on the second and uh, the third keywords in the title. And I will start giving you uh, some sort of um, historic, um, uh, yeah, some little story, let's say, about how thick sets came came into life in in mathematics. And I'm going to start with, um, does it work? Yes, with uh, the uncertainty principle. So it seems a little bit unrelated to spectral inequality, but uh, it will be not. And this is what we know from physics. So Heisenberg tells us that if we consider an electron and we want to determine position and momentum, then you cannot do it at the same time. You have to, I mean, if you want to uh, measure position very precisely, then you have to have a loss um, with uh, for the measurement of the momentum and vice versa. And uh, this has, a, of course, a mathematical counterpart because you cannot do physics without math. And this is related to Fourier analysis. So uh, the, um, let's say, mathematical statement says that um, if you take a non-zero square integral function, uh, which is uh, localized, uh, which is localized, and whose Fourier transform is also localized, then this function must be the zero function. And okay, this is all fine, but uh, then we would like to have it a little bit more concrete. So the, the question that one can ask is, can we make the mathematical uh, statement a little bit more quantitative? And there has been a lot of work doing that. There is actually a very beautiful book by uh, Havin and, and Jorike, which is the title is The Uncertainty Principle in Harmonic Analysis, which is a book which just uh, says, uh, I mean, which just says, um yeah inequalities related to um to this idea and i'm going to focus on uh let's say one version of the many of the many ways you can somehow make this statement quantitative and the concrete question we're going to look at is the following so we want in the end um or, or at least we want to bound the l2 norm of a function on rd by a certain constant times the fun times the norm of the function on a smaller space. And the class of function we're looking at are um, L2 functions in our D, such that the Fourier transform is supported inside some uh, bounded domain, bounded domain in, in our D. And the question is, uh, what else should be, what else should be in the end? What kind of geometry um, properties does has has to be such that this inequality can can come into life. And C, uh, the constant C should be positive and a priori depending on uh, on uh, on the Fourier support, so on this uh, big omega and uh, and on S. And of course, this is not my question. I'm not the, the first one to to ask that. The question goes back actually to Panella in the 60s, or at least where where this is where I first found it. And it was asking, I mean, it was looking at this, this inequality from, uh, um, from a different point of view. It was asking questions about equivalent norms, because you can consider the L2 norm on S, I mean, let's say the L2 norm on S as a semi-norm, and you ask for geometric conditions such that the L2 norms are on RD and the L2 norms are on, on or the semi-norm um, uh, on S are actually um, equivalent. And it also went uh, a little bit further. It asked for P norms instead of L2 norms. But I mean, for us, L2 is going to be uh, more than more than sufficient. 
Um, so this is the question that we're going to uh, to consider, and this is the inequality that in the end is going to be the spectral inequality. So this is a little bit of a disclaimer, or, or at least affiliated to uh, the spectral inequality. Um, the question has been answered uh, by Panaya first. So he posed the question and he also um, uh, gave a partial answer. But um, the, the final question was found I mean, the, the final answer on the final question was found uh, much later on. Um, the main um, uh, so, so the main thing that Panaya found was the perfect geometric condition on S. So there was so in the time there was no refinement of the let's say the geometric properties on S. It was just a refinement of of the techniques and and of the constant C. And this is where uh, thick sets come into the game. So what are they? They are a um, positive um, measurable subset of Rd, um, such that if we take a d-dimensional rectangle uh, with a size of length R1 to Rd, so here we have the vector R, here we have x plus uh, Cartesian product, this is uh, what I would call a d-dimensional rectangle in Rd, you move it uh, everywhere in the space, so here we have for every x, you intersect it with s, and then you measure the Lebesgue And you want that this is always larger than a certain threshold, uh, let's say gamma, um, times the, uh, let's say in the end, the Lebesgue measure of, uh, this should be an Rd, sorry, and this also should be a D. Um, so here we have the Lebesgue measure of this d-dimensional rectangle. So uh, thickness in this in this context means uh, and yeah no I also wrote it down uh, well distributed within R D so wherever you look in R D then you can find a certain portion of um, of this um, of this set that you have considered and you don't need it to be open you just need it to be measurable with positive measure and also another disclaimer because this is not always written in the slides. Whenever I say measurable, it will always mean with positive measure. So I don't want uh, zero measure sets or uh, or things like that. Sometimes it's written, sometimes it's not, but overall um, measurable is always with positive measure. Um, ideas on uh, what a set of what kind of sets can be thick. So we can um, think very easily, and we can take, for example, uh, periodic arrangements in RD. So let's say that you take uh, you, you take balls and you place them periodically in RD, and then this set is going to be thick with certain parameters uh, gamma and uh, and R. So in this case, you are uh, you say. And generally speaking, what what cannot be thick are sets which uh, which have holes with increasing diameter. So in some sense, uh, because we want this well distributedness, if you have um, let's say uh, if you take uh, balls with um, increasing diameters, and you take the complement of that, so let's say R D minus this uh, special um, cons this uh, special uh, sequence of balls, union of balls actually, then this is not going to be thick because if you want to measure a part of uh, a part of S, let's say far away, then you need your d-dimensional rectangle to have size length which increases everywhere because you want this gamma to be uniform for every region of the space. So um, uh, and, and then you're basically uh, doomed to have uh, to have a fixed set. So this is what um, uh, this is, let's say, a counterexample to being thick. Right. Um, any questions so far? It's fine. So um, I think I've uh, talked enough about um, about fix. And this is going to be the main definition on this talk. So uh, you have to bear it in mind. Uh, there are going to be some modifications of it along the line, but this is somehow the central idea. And the answer, so the statement in the end, this is the contribution of several authors. So we have uh, Panaya started a work and it worked for uh, the case P equal to using uh, Fourier analysis. Um, then we have a work by Lovine, Quenzelina, and Kaknelson uh, um, uh, almost at the same time. 
that dealt with the more general case uh, P not equal to. And they also managed to find to give a, a, um, a, a concrete constant C um, with certain dependence. And then in the end case, uh, Kovicchkin in 2001, and uh, he managed to give this uh, constant here that we see, which is the optimal one. So now, the, let's say the, um, um, the summary of all of these works is exactly what it's written there. So um, we have, uh, okay, dimension D larger than one. We have a P between one and infinity. So you can also include the L infinity norm. Uh, B is just a vector with positive component. Then we have S and S is, plays the role of a fixed set. So it has to be uh, measurable in RD. And, uh, you know, and then you can prove that S is a fixed if and only if the statement we were looking for um, holds for every function half with a Fourier transform supported inside a d dimensional rectangle with a side of length b1 up to uh, bd. So here we, we also specify what kind of uh, big omega from the beginning uh, should we take. And uh, if S is a gamma R thick set, so if I know the parameters of the thickness, then I can also have this very nice explicit function, uh, sorry, constant, which goes like gamma, so okay, let's say one over gamma and then R times V here, um, this is the um, Euclidean inner product. So R and V are just um, two vectors in the end. And uh, it turns out that uh, this is a sharp constant. Sharp in which sense? Not in the sense of we can find the function f, which achieves the equality in the inequality, but uh, sharp um, meaning that we cannot do better in terms of the parameter dependence. So this k, which is just a positive number, is not sharp, but the one over gamma and then this inner product are. So you, you basically, um, in the end, uh, what there should be uh, more to do is just to optimize the numbers, hmm? the positive constant. But I mean, in the end, this is um, yeah, this is not so uh, so important. And it seems that up to now, then uh, we had a we had a question. We have actually a full answer. So. Um, we we have not we have uh, that thickness is a sufficient and necessary condition for the inequality we wanted to uh, to have, and we also have a constant which is sharp in some uh, useful sense. Excuse me, uh, I have a question. It's Alexandre. Yeah. So the the b one to b d does not depend on s. No, this is completely unrelated. Okay. So you have uh, somehow a d-dimensional, uh, sorry, yeah, a d-dimensional rectangle for the support of the Fourier transform. And then you have another, let's say, d-dimensional rectangle for the thickness. And these are completely unrelated. So you don't, they, they don't communicate one with the other and you can choose them. I mean, they, they are free to be chosen in some sense. Okay, thank you. And also, this, this is also something I should mention. Here in the statement, it's written for some x in Rd. So, the position of this, let's say, Fourier support is um, it's not important. So you can place it everywhere in your uh, in your space, and um, you you basically don't see where it is. You just see how large it is, just the measure, which is the important part. Um, so and and again, sorry, the, the only dependence on B is, is is in this exponent on the is in the constant. Basically, yeah. it. As soon as you have a function of bounded support, well, where the Fourier tr is, is bounded support, you will get. Yes, exactly. Okay. Huh. Um, right. Any other comments? Because now we're going to uh, switch a little bit. Ah, um, this is something I should know. Uh, I should say. Um, so here I uh, talk about Kovicne in the end. Uh, so the techniques used by the authors are all different. So I said, Panaya used something with, uh, which has to do with Fourier analysis because he worked for P, with the case P equal two. Then Lobinenko and Serena and Kalkenzer, they used, um, if I remember well, um, techniques uh, involving um, subharmonics analysis um, and, and potential theory at some point. And, the, uh, and then it came along Kovicchkine, which uh, somehow gave us this. 
and they just use complex analysis. So that, that was the only thing that, that you required because in the end, the function uh, one works with are analytic. So uh, it, in some sense, it used very uh, basic, um, uh, very basic um, uh, tools somehow with respect to, to the other ones, I mean, uh, and, and they got even better results. I'm not going to give you the proof uh but uh the proof that i'm going to show you later on are based on this idea uh, given by kovichkin so th this is where the complex analysis comes in as a tool so we will see it later how this uh this has to do with uh, with the proof but right now we just need to know that there was a question posed a long time ago and then more or less uh 40 years later we have uh, um we have a full answer and it seems like the story is over Mm -hmm. um, but often mathematics is not, it is not because you can take uh, something from a field and just, uh, you know, throw it somewhere else. So what we're going to do now is to rephrase the assumption or better specify the assumption actually. Um, so now we're going to, to turn to the uh, spectral part of the talk. We consider the Laplacian on RD. Mm -hmm. And uh, E delta of lambda is going to be the spectral projector up to some energy lambda. And we consider elements in the range of this uh, spectral projector. And then PDE uh, tells us that uh, the function, I mean, this function here are a function whose uh, Fourier transform is supported inside a ball. And as has been said, I have a ball, this is a compact set, I can always embed it into, uh, into a larger cube. In this case, we have side length uh, two square root of lambda. So uh, this class of function can be thrown in uh, in the theorem from before. And uh, this is what we're going to do. So uh, in the end, we get uh, we can um, we can have at least one direction of the theorem. So from thickness to the inequality for this very special um, uh, class of function. So for function in a spectral subspace. In the end, here this question you don't have to um, uh, to be too worried. This is exactly the same um, constant from before. Just written in a fancy way. I just took the um, the uh, logarithm, the exponential of the logarithm of the constant, and then you get uh, somehow this exponential um, dependence on the spectral parameter, which is what interests me. So that's why it is written this way. Uh, here, uh, this norm. This is the um, a small L1 norm of uh, of R, which was a vector. And we have some dimension dependence, and then you have this logarithm. But then, I mean, this exponential here, e to the to the power square root of lambda, um, is um, is what interests me. And I really want this uh, uh, this dependence here. Why? Because uh, this is what uh, in control theory is usually called a spectral inequality. So spectral inequality is an inequality of this form. For spectral subspaces, and uh, and then this open basically a whole world, uh, which I'm going to tell you uh, soon. I just need you first to um, to tell you what a spectral inequality is and why it is so important. Because up to now, uh, we don't have this wow effect we would like to have. So um, we have to consider, um, let's say, a domain in R D. We take a set S inside omega, measurable with positive measure. Uh, we need an operator H before we had the Laplacian. Um, let's say here we take a lower semi-bounded self-adjoint operator in uh, L2 of omega. And OK, the spectral projector uh, we also need up to some energy uh, lambda. And a spectral inequality for H is uh, what we've seen up to now. Basically, we bound the L2 norm of the function on the whole space by the L2 norm on the smallest subset by a constant which depends a priori on big omega, on S, and on lambda. So the energy threshold spectral parameter as we want. And we want this inequality to hold for every function in the range of the spectral projector and also for uh, for, for any energy we take. 
Um, and this is all fine. Applications of, so this is what we had. In the end, we had it since the very beginning. This is just a fancy way of uh, calling what we had. Uh, the main attention is on what kind of constant one can get. So the C uh, can be anything a priori, just to have a spectrum inequality. But if you want to use it, so let's say for application, then the C has to have uh, a certain behavior, which is the exponential behavior I just showed you in the slide before. So this E to the power um, square root of lambda. And if that's the case, uh, then we can use it for, uh, in the theory of random Schrodinger operator, of which I'm not an expert, but I can tell you that you can use it to somehow, um, let's say, uh, get a bound on how many eigenvalues you have in a certain, um, in a certain interval, also, so up to a certain threshold. Um, but uh, how it's done and why I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really uh, an expert in that. What we, uh, so what, what I did, or a bit or less better, what I did with my uh, collaborators, which I haven't mentioned yet, uh, is the control theory part. So you can also throw it uh, inside, um, inside this field, again, if you have the right behavior. And um, now we're going to, I'm going to tell you a little bit how this falls into place. And then we're going to we're going to go back to um, um, to um, to Laplace at least. So spectral inequality and control theory. Uh, so to control we need uh, something to control. So we have a control, let's say evolution equation. Uh, the right hand side is the control. So here we have the derivative in time. Then we have the operator. You can, you can take the, the same operator as before. So uh, no negative and self adjoint. The always that bound it is also uh, nice. And then we have a, a special right hand side. So we have the characteristic function of S, which as before is a measurable subset in big omega. And then we have a function. So what we are doing is uh, we have an evolution. And we want to control the evolution just on a certain portion of, uh, of the space. And um, the main question in control theory, but not the only one, is whether you can control your solution to zero. So you usually want to know whether your system is uh, null controllable in, let's say, time capital T larger than zero. So you, you, uh, so you let your, uh, your equation run up to time capital T. And then you look somehow what the, the solution is in the end. And um, so this is formalized like this. So it's more controllable if for every initial datum, we can find a function, control function, such that the solution is, uh, um, is, um, um, is, um, is zero. Exactly. And there is a very beautiful uh, theory here which says that if you have the spectral inequality from before, so if you can bound the L2 norm of, um, of a function in a, in a spectral subspace by a constant times the L2 norms of the same function on a smaller subspace on this S, and the behavior of the constant is something meaningful, like e to the power lambda to the power beta, Beta has to be between zero and one. So we had square root of uh, beta before. That's perfectly fine. And here we have some other um, power smaller than one. Then we can achieve null controllability for the system. Um, this is this has been proved uh, over the years in many uh, um, for uh, many situations. Uh, the the um, original one, so the original proof, the original idea goes back to Le Bo and Robiano in uh, uh, 95. And then there is a long list of uh, authors, which I, haven't, uh, which I haven't written down here. I'm just mentioning Miller because he, he put a lot of effort in proving, uh, in reproving uh, the, the uh, let's say the seven of Le Bo and Robiano. And then here I have uh, Nakish Teufa, Tauzuna and Vesselich, because this exact statement is taken from, from their work. But um, yeah, th there is many more uh, which uh, 
um, which I have inside it here. And um, the proof, uh, th there are several ways of uh, going about the proof. There is somehow the, the straight way of just, uh, um, let's say, constructing the function f that does the work. Uh, or there is somehow, you can go through the back door uh, with some, um, with some, uh, some other trick. Um, I'm just going to comment on why you need this uh, special uh, exponential behavior. Um, this is because of uh, of the semi group of the operator that you get. Um, so here, uh, for let's say no negative and self adjoint and lower semi bounded, then you have the semi group which is a C zero semi group. So the norm of the semi group is bounded by uh, an exponential with uh, usually with a negative exponent, and you want uh, this bound for the operator norm of the semi group to match the constant of the spectral inequality. So you can somehow combine the two. So this is what does the trick. So it seems like you have just one ingredient to have null controllability, but actually there is you know, some more from the operator that you have to uh, bring into the game in order to make things fall into place. Um, but then, I mean, in the end, once you have the spectral inequality, you basically, uh, you basically can go and prove any almost any result in control theory. There are also other versions of the spectral inequality that gives you some other kind of controllability results, but this is a different story, so I'll just leave it aside. For, for us, null controllability is going to, to be enough. Um, so uh, just to have a summary. So we started with um, work in, let's say, complex analysis. We traveled to the world of, uh, let's say, uh, in, in the spectral world. And from the spectral world, we also traveled to control theory. Now it's time to put the things together. So in the slide before that, I showed you a spectral inequality for the Laplacian on RD. And this uh, theorem three just uh, tells us that we can just feed it into this, uh, let's say, null controllability machinery and get a positive answer. So what we noticed with, uh, with Ivan Vesovic back in 2018, when we started somehow looking at the thick sets and uncertainty principle and things which at first were completely unrelated to control theory, is that uh, we could answer the, the question for the null controllability of the controlled integration on full space. And the trick is that you have to, uh, to have here uh, as a set S, a thick set. So as long as you control on a thick set, then you have uh, null controllability. And that was uh, somehow the, I would say, the starting point of um, for, for for some people to look at spectral inequalities from, uh, let's say, from the point of view of complex analysis. Because um, in the end, this was uh, this was an answer that was uh, that has been looking for um, for let's say, quite some time, and people were getting closer and closer, but then in the end, uh, with a bit of luck, uh, we just closed the gap. And uh, this was also the starting point of looking at uh, other kind of control integration. So people somehow um, started obtaining spectral inequality for uh, other, for, let's say, let's say, Laplacian on different spaces. Um, so let's say strips or half spaces, but also for uh, for other operators, for example, the harmonic oscillator, so something like Laplacian plus the potential, which is the uh, norm of x squared. Um, and the spectral inequality they were uh, trying to obtain were based on the techniques of Kovitschkine, because it seemed like it gave um, a, um, a sharp constant for most of the cases. And it also gave uh, something very specific, some, something that you can control very well. And they were obtaining like uh, a series of null controllability results. And um, and then I was talking with uh, with Albert Selman, uh, always in, in Dortmund, where I was uh, before, always in the group of Ivan Vesovic. And then we asked ourselves, OK, now people are somehow doing this this, this proof that uh, they are uh, they are doing these these techniques over and over again, right? To obtain whatever they wanted, and we ask ourselves if there wasn't a way of somehow streamlining the proof, of having a general framework to obtain spectral inequalities with complex analytical techniques. 
And we came out of this with this idea of uh, writing down a framework for uh, spectral inequality, let's say, a la Kovrichkina. And this is a this is what I want to um, uh, present to you in the next slide. So what we wanted uh, was somehow take the uh, thickness uh, property uh, on different domains and then uh, find conditions on the operator such that we could get um, yeah, the, the inequality we wanted with, uh, with certain techniques. So um, we looked at uh, domains omega in RD uh, and uh, we wanted to be, uh, we wanted to, to get little omega, some kind of six bed inside uh, inside these uh, different domains. So we went on and modified a little bit the geometric assumption. So now we look at uh, somehow thickness within a domain. So the idea is always the same. We take here for simplicity, we took a d-dimensional cube. So tidal length are uh, always the same. So you move it around in your space and you always find a certain portion of, uh, of your set. Um, this uh, gamma r to the b. And then here in blue, this is what thickness within uh, big omega uh, means. Um, right, so uh, the thickness, so to somehow streamline the idea of thickness, wasn't really, it, it's never been a problem. It never is, it is the easy part. But then the question is, what do you need for the operator? Hmm? So we went for uh, H being lower semi-bounded set for joint on L2 of big omega with some other assumption, this bench and type inequality as we called it. So we want that for every function in the range of the spectral projector up to energy lambda, we can bound sums of L2 norms of uh, derivatives by constant that depends, okay, on m, this is the index of the summation, the lambda, spectral parameter, times the L2 norms on the function itself. So in the end, we want to bound derivatives by the function or with the help of the function. And this at first looks uh, very exotic, uh, but in the end, and we'll see that in the proof, uh, this is just an analytic, the sort of analyticity assumption on uh, on the operator age. So this is just to, this just states that the function we consider, so this uh, element in here, are in the end analytic functions, because of course we want to have complex analysis inside, so we have to have, I mean, analyticity has to, you know, uh, come in at some point. Um, so this is the, uh, the class of operators we, we identify with this uh, somehow fancy assumption. And uh, why it's called Bernstein, Bernstein type? Uh, because there is, a, um, there is a result in Fourier analysis, which is called the Bernstein inequality, which for functions with um, uh, compactly supported Fourier transform, uh, bounds uh, the, um, the norm of the derivatives by uh, the norm of the function times uh, a constant which depends on the Fourier support. So that was the inspiration in the end. Uh, and, and that's why. And uh, we need one more. Um, we need that, uh, we need classes of domains. And uh, we took domains which have a nice covering in the end. So this, this looks a bit scary, it, it, it uh, doesn't need to be. So the domain omega we consider for this uh, framework are um, domains having the kappa, rho, L, eta covering. Kappa, rho, and eta are positive constant. Uh, kappa is actually a strictly down in one and a natural number in the end. And L is just a vector with um, components um, larger or equal than rho. And okay, we have a covering. So uh, it means that we can find the family QJ of complex, of convex, sorry, non empty and bounded uh, open sets such that, okay, we cover the whole space. This is what uh, little e says. Then we have again something written fancy, but um, in the end, this kappa here 
plays the role of, um, let's say, an overlapping number. So we want that at one point, at most kappa elements uh, or at most kappa QJ uh, overlap at the same time. Um, and then we have part three. Uh, this is somehow compatible with, uh, with the thickness. We want that every QJ uh, contains uh, a Q of certain side length, in this case it's raw, and it is contained inside a D-dimensional rectangle with size of length L1 up to LD. So in the end, um, the idea here is that you can, I mean, if, uh, if rho from the covering and dr from the thickness are, let's say, the same, uh, then QJ intersected omega, or better, the measure of QJ intersected omega is always uh, strictly larger than zero. Um, and that was, uh, this is what's going on here. And then we have part four. This is um, somehow for technical reason. Um, this is just to somehow to have better parameter if the QJs have, uh, let's say, unfavorable ratio between volume and diameter to the power D. And it was just to make um, somehow the, um, let's say, the estimate looks a little bit better. And but uh, let's say that we can skip four if if you don't want to. Uh, to have this bijection uh, lying around, right? Um, so uh, this is what we had. It, it's quite a lot. <laughs> it's a whole slide of assumption. Uh, but now I can finally tell you uh, how this falls into place. This is what the work we did with uh, Abel Seyman, um, let's say some years ago. So we take all the assumption from the four. So this uh, special covering with um, a row equal r, r is exactly the parameter from uh, the thickness that we also take. So this little omega needs to be this time gamma r thick within omega. So we can really fit a, a d-dimensional cube with a size of length r inside every uh, element of the covering. H is my uh, lower semi-bounded cipher joint operator uh, on L2 with this uh, bench and type inequality. So with this analyticity, let's say analyticity assumption lying around. And uh, if for uh, lambda in R, uh, this, um, this series here is convergent, uh, then we can have a spectral inequality with uh, this behavior here. So the C2, C1, and C3 are positive constant depending on the covering. So they contain the kappa, dl, and the uh, eta. The dependence on R is uh, down here. Then we have the gamma as well. And then we have uh, the, the exponent that contains, let's say, the lambda dependence. So this logarithm of h of lambda. And if you're lucky with this constant, so the CBM of lambda, uh, which is the constant from the bench and type inequality from before, uh, then you obtain a, a nice behavior that you can throw in this, into the, the machinery of uh, control theory. So in the end, if this series turns, turns out to be some exponential, then uh, here you get again something like lambda to some power, which should be something useful. And uh, this, this is um, um, this is in the end what we got in a very, let's say, uh, abstract and uh, and general way. And um, um, now it's time to give you the proof. So I, I, it's uh, about forty minutes. I talk and I haven't told you about the proof whatsoever. So this doesn't still classify um, as a math talk, as some people would say. But before that, let's just get, just uh, let me give you some remarks. So first of all, uh, this is consistent with previous results. So at least for um, the spectral inequalities, so we can recover the spectral inequality for the Laplace on FD and on the infinite strip, and also on the harmonic oscillator. So all those operators satisfy, uh, let's say, the bench and type inequality uh, from the slide before. And um, we also managed to add some kind, some operators, not that not as many as we wanted, but still we could go, um, for example, for certain divergent type of, of certain divergent type operators, 
with a certain uh, matrix A, which has to be uh, as I mean, with um, with um, entries which are constant. Um, then we need a positive definite and a symmetric if we talk about RD and the half space. And if we want to consider divergence type of operators on um, a Cartesian product of finite or infinite intervals, so AJ and BJ runs from minus infinity to plus infinity, then we need a diagonal matrix. So this is just because uh, for more general ones, we couldn't find a way to, to prove the, the bench and avoid them. Maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that for general matrices A, uh, this is not even true. Um, and uh, again, uh, sharpness, this is also a good point whenever you have something which is really quantitative. We can again um, uh, get sharpness in the sense of I cannot do better than that. So uh, somehow this dependence on gamma r and let's say the spectral parameter is uh, is never going to be better than that. The constants, of course, uh, the numbers you can always uh, optimize, but the rest you cannot. Right. And uh, now we're going to see the first uh, sketch of proof uh, of this talk. And uh, this is again based on the idea of Kovitchkin, which I haven't told you yet about. Um, but in the end, the let's say the bottom line is a, a, it's something that everybody uh, somehow could uh, think about. It's a very simple idea, although very powerful. So in the end, we want to prove something for uh, L2 norms on uh, big omega and the L2 norms on little omega. And we have the covering uh, for the domain uh, lying around. So the idea is, OK, let us prove something uh, local for every uh, covering element. So we prove, let's say, the spectral inequality for L2 norms on QJ and L2 norms on QJ intersected with little omega. And then uh, we sum over QJs. We don't want to sum, however, over all of them because it's going to be too much. We just sum on enough of them. And now you have to make this enough uh, being concrete. Um, so um, steps of proof are the following. So the main ingredient is here this batch and type inequality. So the, oper the um, properties of the operator, the operator um, uh, plays the biggest role. And the batch and type inequality tells us that the functions I consider, so this function, uh, so this, the elements of the spectral subspace in the end are analytic, so very good. Um, it gives us a way of um, finding enough of the QJs, so um, you can distinguish good and bad elements of the covering, which sounds funny, uh, and a priori a little bit crazy, but it's not, because um, you can say, OK, I have a good a good element of the covering if I can find my bench and type inequality locally. So on every QJ with some, of course, modified constants. So I go again from global to local. I just make the constant a little bit larger. And if this, this works, then I'm good. Then the, then the elements of the cover of the covering is, is a good one. And uh, this is an a priori definition. But you can prove that uh, if you sum over uh, all of the QJs, so if you sum this um, L2 norms of the function squared, uh, then uh, you find at least half of the L2 norm of the total function. So summing over all good cubes would give you good results. Uh, this is not going to be, uh, to be problematic. And uh, third of all, um, we can also go one step further. You not only get, uh, let's say, a um, local bench and type inequality, you also get something point-wise. Point-wise on every good QJ. So uh, here point-wise is a little bit misleading. It's just partially point-wise. Um, but in the end, uh, with a little bit of, uh, of work, you can identify, uh, you can find a point x in every uh, good cube such that the absolute value of the derivative of the function at that point 
is smaller or equal than some constant times the L2 norms of uh, uh, the L2 norms on the function on the cube. So it's pointwise uh, just, let's say, in the left hand side, but uh, yeah, I, still, I would still call it pointwise. Um, so this is all uh, things that you have to work a little bit to get, not too much. Um, but uh, what actually does the trick is this amenicity and uh, this somehow kind of point-wise best on inequality I just uh, told you about. Because um, one and three, so um, amenicity uh, plus something else, uh, tells you that the uh, Taylor expansion on the function on, uh, on a complex neighborhood of, uh, of QJ converges. And therefore, you can analytically extend it to such a neighborhood. And uh, then uh, you can work with your uh, analytic extension. And, uh, and now you come, uh, you call for Kovitskin's work, and you take basically the uh, complex analytic uh, tools, and you somehow uh, uh, you bring them in uh, to obtain what? Uh, to obtain the local the uh, local uh, spectral inequality for uh, for QJ. So now this this is where somehow the magic happens. And the question is a little bit why? Uh, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to be uh, quicker than um, um, quicker than I uh, wanted to, but I still. Uh, tell you some. You can certainly take up to the hour if you if you want. Okay, I'll. Your choice. Okay, I'll, I'll still have some slide to go through, but let's see how far how far I can get. Um, but let let's just give some motivation for this uh, for this machinery here. So I mean, why why sh why should it work? So the central piece is um, is, is a uh, is a lemma uh, which goes back to Kovitskine, which says that if you have a function which is analytic on a complex disk uh, centered at zero and it's non-vanishing at zero, then you can uh, bound the L infinity norm of the function on zero one, so on the on the real interval, uh, by a constant uh, which depends by a certain constant times the L infinity norm of the function on a measurable subset E of 0, 1. And the constant E uh, E gives is also explicit in the measure of E. So again, it doesn't matter where E is. It just uh, matters that it's uh, measurable, and then the measure comes, comes here inside. So um, this is now something uh, one-dimensional. And uh, we have more dimension, and this is also related to the L-infinity norm, why we want to work with the L2 norm. So now the technical part is to uh, make it fit into the game. So the idea, so now you have to pass from one dimension to the dimension and from L-infinity norm to um, L2 norms, and you also have to somehow um, transform 0, 1 into QJ and E into uh, QJ uh, intersected with, uh, with little omega. So here there is a, some technical work to do, but once they're done, then you basically have your, um, your estimate with the elements you want, and you are able to sum over, over all of the QJs. And, uh, and then, you're basically, then you're basically done. And again, with some luck, you can also have uh, some good dependence on lambda, and you can also feed it to uh, uh, to some other um, into some other machinery. Some sense. Okay. Um, so this was uh, all a little bit, um, I mean, uh, not detailed at all, I would say. But uh, somehow this is. I just wanted to explain you how all the assumptions that I had fall into pieces. So somehow the bench sign gives us the identity, and uh, the covering is need. So the special covering is needed to uh, somehow also work locally. And then you have in the end uh, some let's say black box of complex analysis that comes in and somehow does the job. But so this is how uh, things uh, fall into places. And um, it looked like uh, the end of it. Um, when when we when we arrived at this, we were really happy. And uh, I mean, we could also somehow um, 
um, yeah, work a little, so think a little bit what kind of, uh, so let's say, concrete operators we could take for this age. Uh, so we went on and worked and worked a little bit about, um, so on, on how to, to prove the, this uh, bench and type inequality criteria and so on, but somehow it seemed like we were at a dead end and we, we somehow um, uh, exploited uh, the topic as good as, um, I mean, as, uh, yeah, as far as we could. Uh, but um, this is not really true. I mean, there are many ways that you can somehow think beyond that. And uh, one, um, so somehow one idea was given us uh, from uh, was given us from let's say from from Delio uh, Delio Munilo from um, the Fan Universität in Hagen. Uh, he is an expert in um, analysis on graphs, and then uh, was giving a seminar in his um, um, in his series of seminars, and then he asked, "Oh, can you do something similar for uh, you know for graphs instead of uh, Euclidean domains?" And it was a very interesting uh, question because apparently this, uh, so there are some people working on a similar topic in, um, in uh, let's say analysis on graphs, but something like that wasn't really found. So it, it was um, still somehow in the air. And then we uh, we started working with him about this idea of somehow leaving the, uh, the continuous setting, if you want, uh, behind and going, uh, and going discreet. Um, so in the next, let's say, eight minutes, I'll try to tell you uh, how all of this can be um, uh, translated to the world of graphs. And actually, we went a little bit beyond that. Beyond that, we went uh, and looked for, in the end, a collection of intervals, or rather, uh, let's say, spectral inequalities for, uh, if you want, vector value function. So the inspiration, so the starting point, was always to have the complementary graphs equipped with the standard Laplacian. And metric graphs here means that the edges carry um, carries a length. So uh, you have a metric space, uh, you have norms, and uh, you have everything you want. Um, um, but we want to do a little bit more, and then we somehow uh, cook up a new, um, a new um, um, a new structure in some sense, uh, you know, not, not really new, but we worked on this more general um, uh, more general spaces and we also didn't consider just uh, any uh, any age. So here we, we couldn't go for the um, for let's say the general case yet. We um, we um, um, we specified on uh, magnetic Laplacian. So um, still a little bit more than just a normal Laplacian. Um, so the uh, setting is the following. Um, so E is just a finite or countably infinite set. So uh, that doesn't matter. It's not a problem. Uh, we have a series uh, sequence L E uh, of positive with positive uh, yeah let's say with positive elements we, we, which we call and then we have the corresponding intervals we call them edges just uh, for yeah because we're thinking about graphs. And we have uh, yeah this 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 uh, this joint union as a disjoint uh, of um, of edges. So calligraphic E is going to be um, the space um, uh, this collection, and we want the the lengths so this L E not to accumulate at zero. So the infimum over all L E has to be zero. So the the lengths cannot be a sequence converging to zero. It's not allowed. So we want semi bounded geometry. Otherwise. Uh, we are kind of doomed. Um, so this is the space, and to define the operator, I also need uh, what we call internal and external edges. So uh, we just um, take um, indices in E um, whose length, so or uh, with um, such that the associated length is um, yeah finite. And then uh, the, for the external edges, then we just collect all indices such that the length is uh, is infinite. Um, now, what a magnetic Laplacian is? So first of all, any function that we want to consider on this calligraphic E is going to be vector valued, and f prime it's going to appear um, in a while. Uh, sorry, soon. Sorry. 
um, it's going to be just, uh, uh, again, a vector body function. Um, and uh, again, we need some space. So here we take the canonical space L2 of calligraphic E is going to be just the direct sum of um, L2 spaces on zero LE, this time the, uh, the open interval. And the norm is exactly what one would expect. So the sum of some modular two norm squared on every, let's say, interval to the power one and a half. Um, we need, because we, we want to work with the Mardetti Laplacian, we need a real valued function in, um, yeah, we wanted more, we wanted a lot of generality. So we took this uh, L1 uh, log of calligraphic E space. So A has to be in this space, which just tells you that every um, component of the function is locally in a one in the corresponding edge. So uh, nothing too fancy in the end. Um, but since we have uh, edges of finite air and infinite lengths, we also need boundary conditions. And these are uh, given by a certain choice of a closed subspace Y inside this a small L2 space of uh, E a direct sum with a small L2 of uh, the internal edges. So here we just collect, let's say, um, um, yeah, uh, beginning, end, and end on every edge where, where we have uh, a beginning and an end. And the maniacal love fashion here uh, associated to Y, uh, which plays the role of boundary condition, is given uh, like that. So here we have minus E. We have E F prime plus A F and again the derivative. So this term here inside, it is what is usually called the magnetic derivative. And then we have again uh, some more minus A times E F prime plus uh, A times F. And then we have to uh, specify the boundary condition again by Y. So we have this um, psi plus or minus, which we call boundary maps. It just gives you value of functions in zero, so at the beginning of every of every edge, plus uh, the values of the function at the end, at the end of the interval, if the interval or the edge rather is a um, uh, finite length. And then we want uh, c plus of f inside y, inside y, so uh, somehow beginning and end point of the function in y. And then beginning and end point of the magnetic derivative to be in the um, orthogonal complement of y. So this, this is just uh, this is a little bit technical. Uh, and also here there is a lot of the uh, domain operator that I didn't want to put into the slide, but uh, you also need to to define the domain and be sure that everything goes uh, goes well. But uh, in the end, what we want is just to take a magnetic Laplacian with the largest class possible of boundary conditions. And for example, Dirichlet and Norman uh, falls into this, um, uh, this, this framework. So first of all, just to fix some ideas, if A is zero, then you have your normal Laplacian, so your uh, Laplacian on calligraphic E with certain boundary conditions. And um, just so also just to fix some ideas, if y is the not space, then of course y perp if the, the whole space, but this doesn't matter. But then okay, this should that should have just be a c plus. So forget about the minus here. So p, c plus of f inside the not space means just that I mean the function has value zero and the beginning of the end. So you basically get uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. And if you want Neumann, then you have to uh, swap y and the orthogonal complement. And you have, okay, you have the, uh, the a here uh, inside, so you have some sort of Neumann type. If a is zero, so this term doesn't, doesn't appear, then you, have, then you have the usual uh, Neumann boundary conditions then, then, that we all know. Um, but then you can also be a little bit more fancy, right? I mean, Y just needs to be a closed subspace, so you can uh, you can choose it. Uh, you can choose it as you like. And uh, with this uh, new setting, uh, then we could actually adapt a bit uh, the um, the idea of the proof of before. So the idea is always to use uh, this uh, set of techniques. 
here we have we have to consider vector valued function so you also have to adjust a bit the uh, definition of thickness because now you somehow have many uh, intervals uh, together so what thickness is it's uh, not entirely clear and uh, we come up with some with this idea of thickness actually um, it's not exactly thickness it's called sampling and I'll tell you where to look for for the differences so it's again a long definition but somehow what we do is that we consider measurable sets inside every edge and we call them gamma rho sampling for some gamma and some rho if uh, we can find a finite or countably infinite family of closed intervals that cover my edge and which are okay here it's written mutually uh, mutually disjoint it just means that they are one after the other so they are adjoint one to the other um we always have so we have that the length of uh, these new intervals is that is at most the row so the length varies but the main idea stays so whenever we intersect omega e with uh, j e k then we we uh, we see at least gamma times uh, the measure of j e k so we always can detect parts of omega um, for this j e k so the difference between sampling and thickness is in this uh, second bullet point so now the length is not fixed so before we had a fixed side length for uh, which was r for r1 up to rd but here here we can vary so um, we, we are so we can have also something a little bit smaller uh, we don't have anything uh, anything fixed um, and uh, we also uh, lose the overlapping so before for thickness you can move you we could move the uh, d-dimensional rectangle everywhere in the space but here, uh, those, um, those J, E, K are not allowed to overlap. So they, I mean, they can have some overlap, but just at one point. So we also lose that. Uh, but this is just for one edge. Uh, if we want, uh, of course, um, to have, uh, if, you, if we consider more edges, then we have to take the union of all of those uh, omega E. And this is going to be a subset inside calligraphic E, which is going to be gamma rho sampling. If each omega E inside the edge is gamma rho sampling. So this is uh, somehow what happens. So in the end, what we do is that we need to have a portion of my omega inside every edge. So um, everything has to be covered. And uh, you, you cannot get away with, with uh, anything and that. If, if, I mean, at least with this technique if you can actually if uh, you actually can uh, it's uh, unclear but um, um, maybe maybe it can be done and uh, I'm going to uh, finish uh, okay here there are some examples I'll just uh, skip through them um, and I just don't mention them because I'm already uh, for uh, I'm already over the hour. So I just uh, give you the, the final statement here, uh, which we had with um, uh, Daniel and Albert, um, which is uh, again a spectral inequality. Uh, but surprise, surprise, here we also have something for the magnetic derivative. So it seems like um, we were uh, somehow going to obtain exactly the same just for larger classes of operators. But in the end, we also get uh, we also get something more. So we can also bound the L two norms of uh, of these special derivatives uh, by the L two function on of the same function times the characteristic function. So on a smaller subset, let's say, and the constant is always explicit, and also it's uh, it's the same. So we have here the same, and we also have the nice square root of lambda uh, in the dependence. So this means that if you want, you can also throw it again inside some uh, abstract uh, controllability uh, machinery and, and get uh, some more controllability results for evolution equations on, uh, on this calligraphic E.
And um, I think I'm going to stop here. There is uh, one last slide which somehow tells you a little bit more uh, about graphs, uh, but it's basically just a rephrasing of this theorem for uh, um, compact metric graphs uh, with the standard Laplacian. So uh, you don't really get anything out of that. Um, but uh, it's really time to, um, uh, I'm going to skip that to thank you for your attention. And thank you for staying with me uh, all along the way. Thank you for the talk. We have time for questions now. So uh, if someone has a question, please go ahead and. Ask. Yeah, so um, you mentioned that if your graphs don't have semi-bounded geometry, you're, you're, you, you don't have any chance of any of this working. But in the last inequality you've shown us, I couldn't see where the semi-bounded geometry appears in the in the constants. Um, um actually it doesn't. Uh it does some uh in the end, uh it is some uh technical thing we needed to um um, um uh, to work with. Um, um how can I explain that? Um um because um how is it yeah uh, so this gamma here mm -hmm. um it's not allowed to be uh somehow zero on every edge okay so maybe i'll just show you the this last example uh maybe one of these examples so the, this last example here this mm -hmm. one so somehow um so the gamma is not allowed to be zero um mm -hmm. for the definition and um, if you choose, uh, let's say, this omega k uh, such that the lamps accumulate at zero, then you mm. are not thick. So wow. this was why we needed this semi bounded geometry, because somehow we, we, I mean, we can't get gamma to be zero, and then we also need the lamps not to be zero, because otherwise uh, we get problems with, uh, um, with uh, yeah, when something when summing over all the edges in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, for your per the other results on in in R D do 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 you uh do you think it works when it's not analytic or is it essential? Um, I don't think it works when it's not analytic. Uh, I think you you really need uh, you really need that. Um, if it's not analytic, maybe you can. Um, I don't know. Maybe you can relax a bit the definition of thickness, so somehow allow some other conditions that makes you work with uh, with something else. But um, somehow the main role is always placed by the operator. So um, I'm not sure. I definitely don't think that this kind of technique can work with uh, with things that are not analytic. So without analyticity, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that it's not possible. Huh? So there, there are some ways of circumventing that. You just uh, avoid spectral, uh, you just avoid uh, complex analysis. So um, there are spectral inequalities. So this kind of inequality obtained uh, with, for example, Kahneman estimates and uh, mm -hmm. some other techniques um, and sure. you can go without. Thank you. Does anyone else wants to want to comment or ask a question? If not, let's thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we will uh, rejoin next week. Uh, let me check what I have with a, a talk by Yves Colin Vazier, uh, who will speak um, on the spectrum of the Poincare operator on ellipsoids. So, uh, same place next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, um, thank you and uh, have a good evening, you all. Bye. Oh, bye bye.